Welcome to this episode of the Spinoza Triad. In this episode, though, it's the Spinoza Duo, with myself and Richard. Pressure of work and family commitments and all the things that get in the way have prevented Dan from joining us this time. However, Richard and I did find the time to, in our usual way, share some views and exchange some ideas. As a child, like most children, I was warned about the danger of strangers. Not in any way that would terrify, but in the usual way that most parents attempt to guard their children against one of the dangers they perceive to be out there in the world. As I did with my children, don't go with strangers. If someone asks you to get into a car, what do you say? And so on. Like most people, that's probably my first awareness, somewhat after my first awareness of death, and somewhat before my first awareness that my parents were, after all, not infallible. It was my first awareness that the world contained bad people. And I probably thought, in my own childish way, why isn't everyone good, kind, friendly, caring, dependable? After all, we're all sharing the same journey through this mortal world. It wasn't such a childish thought, looking back on it, it might occur to us all. Why are some people cruel? And then more troubling, are we all capable of cruelty, of brutality, of violence? Later on in life, you might look back on things done and said selfishly and wonder why you did them or said them. Partly because of an awareness of the number of books whose title contains the name or the word psychopath, Richard and I began our discussion with the starting point of psychopaths. During our discussion, we use the term regularly, referring to psychopathy and psychopath rather than sociopath. The distinction is somewhat ambiguous. Some will indicate that sociopaths are more obviously unpleasant, and others that psychopaths are more violent and dangerous, more devious. The terms are used interchangeably. However, we will use the term psychopath, as it is used in books such as John Ronson's The Psychopath Test, or The Wisdom of Psychopaths by Kevin Dutton, or famously, the man who devised the original psychopath test, still used largely as a means of determining the traits of psychopathy, Robert Hare's Without Conscience. We also refer to Kent Keel, The Psychopath Whisperer. We think about normative ethics, the media, the problem of evil, nature and nurture, self-determination, and our own experiences. I hope you enjoy listening as we share our thoughts. Psychopaths are to- a topic that you can sell a book and a podcast, probably. <laughs> if by the question "why psychopaths," you're asking Richard, "Why are we so interested in them?" I think that's one side of our conversation. If the other part of "why psychopaths" is why they exist, given that the advantages of communality, the advantages of, of, of caring and supportive human beings, seem to be so outrageously obvious. Then why do psychopaths? Why have why have they emerged? What is it? Uh, are psychopaths extremely rare examples of profound mental illness, or as people like Robert Hare in his book Without Conscience, or Kevin Dutton in The Wisdom of Psychopaths, another book which essentially proposes that there's some kind of evolutionary socio-cultural advantage in having among us, having among the population, psychopaths. They're actually, you know, they're creative and they're, um, they, they drive kind of society forward. They are the innovators, ruthless bastards that they may be. They, they are what, you know, you need a few ruthless bastards among us. I don't, I don't buy that at all. 
Well, I think he, he mentions that though in that book, doesn't he, Dutton? He says that, um, Maybe in that book I saw an interview with him. He says that really the language of nature nurture is kind of outdated in this sense, and we should be looking more in terms of epigenetics. And by that, you know, I'm assuming he means genetic factors that are turned on and off through experience, you know, sort of social and, and I guess almost cult- cultural, but definitely sort of environmental. And I mean, one of, one of the things there, if you compare those two books, so Robert Hare's, I think, written. He's the guy that actually came up with the psychopathic checklist. He's, he sort of centralised the idea. So he, he's got a 40-point checklist. It's revised as well now, I think, where you, where psychologists around the world can have a, a universal kind of gauge they can use to sort of compare psychopath characteristics and a kind of cluster of characteristics. And one of the things I noticed with... I, mean, I like you, I, I looked at the Robert Hare one, the Wisdom of Psychopath. There was another one called The Psychopathic Whisperer, which was really good. As you sort of go along, so I think the Robert Hare book, so it first came out in 93, so it's quite old. Since then, a lot of the research into this area is used with uh, fMRI so brain scans now. You've got what was initially, a, I guess, almost a qualitative judgment formulated around a series of questions. You would need a, a clinician to carry out the test, but it's a series of questions where you're looking for these characteristics. Now, that's combined with the brain scans, the brain, brain imaging. If you can see differences in brain activity among certain people who hold certain beliefs, well, not beliefs, attitudes, they appear to show no signs of remorse or guilt, or they, see, they seem to be very excessively self-centred. And you can see that difference in the brain. Like, I mean, the very in the Robert Hare book, he... The ECG of psychopaths, the, just the brain wave pattern, he says, is very strange among one in about 100 people or one in a few hundred people. So lots, lots of people have these odd brain wave patterns. And, you, and today, of course, you can look at little parts of the brain firing up and interacting. And that, that may show a similar thing, might it? It might, might show, as you say, that either over the evolutionary genetics or epigenetics in our lifetime, that somehow some people's brains are wired differently. I think as well, um, I mean, there's, there's a guy, James Fallon, so I think he was a neuroscientist. He'd been brain imaging, I don't know if it was in prisons, like uh, violent offenders or, you know, you, you run an experiment. And he he took his family's brains and, and, and he, he ran them all through his imaging. And he, he comes across one and it's like the, it's the amygdala and the orbital cortex, the front of the brain here. And, and, and it was just dead. And he was like, oh, wow, you know, I've got one. And, and then when he, when he goes through the data, it's his brain. <laughs> it's actually him. <laughs> no, oh, that's horrible. <laughs> so, and, and then he started to talk to his, I think it was his mother or his aunt or someone, who then goes on to say that on the mother's side of the family, there were a number of cases of murders of people killing people, family relations. And his argument is that they are genetic in that sense. But again, he's quite keen to point out that you know, it's only one determinant on you becoming violent. People can have this brain abnormality, but without it actually becoming an issue. Well, that, 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 well, that takes you back to what, what triggers or what fires off the... What makes the difference between someone with that brain abnormality? It's, it's a terrible... It's like going into your family tree. I've, got, I've started doing my family tree. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, I found I'm related to half of South London, as it turns out. I mean, because you keep going sideways and more cousins and cousins are related to distant people. And the family tree, it would be how terrible to go into your family tree and start seeing, you know, ah, there's, ah, oh, yes, what happened to him? Ah, oh, he was locked up for killing five people. <laughs> what happened to him? Oh, that person, he's known as Horace the Mad. <laughs> oh, no, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> yeah, somehow. It's yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, so that begs the question, what fires off, what triggers, what is the difference? I can't profess to know much about the inner workings of the brain, but broadly speaking, the the two areas, it's quite interesting, that aren't firing properly in a psychopath, and largely they're dead in a relationship. Well, not dead, but they're not not firing up properly between each of them, but either individually is the, the amygdala which is part of the limbic system, which is kind of mo- emotional impulses. It balances anger, sex drives, you know, addiction. In old Freudian, I'm guessing you're looking broadly at a kind of id 
area you know not not that not that we would use that language nowadays i guess in this sense but it's it's those urges and then the orbital cortex like the old-fashioned superego conscience it's the moral processing so you've got this this issue of, of of urges and that aren't balanced you would act the brake if you like at the front would say perhaps you should not do this. this isn't a great idea isn't necessarily there so i listened to one of the interviews i think it was Robert Ressler, the FBI profiler, and he said it isn't necessarily that, and he's talking about serial killers here, but I'm going to lump, this, I'm assuming that most serial killers are psychopathic, but he was saying it's not necessarily that there's an overwhelming urge to kill, it can be quite a small one, um, but or a curiosity, but on many of these people at school, very highly, there isn't, there's no break at all, there's no reason why you shouldn't, you know, so it's not, I just found that quite interesting. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's this curious, well, view of the psychopath isn't the raging lunatic with an axe that can be charming, deeply manipulative, highly empathetic, but selectively empathetic. We talked about this the other day, how, how they, they can read your emotions really well. There's not a problem with misunderstanding what you're saying. In fact, they read them too well. They can see your weaknesses. And that, I mean, I haven't encountered people like that since I left school. The school bully, the kind of kid you avoided because they could somehow almost smell your fear. You know, they knew your weaknesses. They could tell from the way you observed things and said things that you were afraid of this. Your insecurities about your looks or your fa- your fear of that teacher that you were trying to hide or your or your fear of them that you were trying to hide. And then the the charming ability to manipulate. On a lesser scale, you've certainly met. I've certainly met people and talked to people who you realise as a sort of um, convincing in a way that you, as an intelligent person, as a person you think is going to evaluate other people very critically and know people, and all, you realise you're being manipulated. So the heightened qualities of the psychopath is frightening because um, you know, most of us are sheep and they're wolves, aren't they? You know, And we go our little sheepy lives quite comfortably, expecting the best of people, trusting strangers, relying on politeness in others, relying in sensitivity in others, until you encounter someone like that. Gary Ridgway, I I remember reading a book on him, The the Green River Killer. He stabbed a boy when he was, I think he was about early teens, and it was another young lad. He said, why did you do it? He goes, I just wanted to know what it felt like, just to to stab someone. No kind of, it was just a curiosity. You, You also have the psychopath personality struggles with binding emotional hits if you like they don't really experience fear in the same way we do they don't experience love they don't so trying to get anything takes a lot of simulation so they're by definition they're they're very impulsive and look for uh, satisfaction through extreme behaviors but uh, but that's balanced i suppose in some respects by being very um manipulative as well so I mean, they're, 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 they're a real problem, aren't they? Because, I mean, my, my interest in this area was first sparked in conversation with, I think it was Lynn. John and I worked with her for many years. Really uh, intelligent and thoughtful person. She was a sociologist. Before sociology, she worked in prisons doing, like, psychometric testing. on. And I remember getting to a conversation with her once about... We were just arguing around the sort of social construction or, or, or the sort of environmental arguments around genetically determined responses for the way people develop and um we were talking about the brain and i was talking i was saying about psychopathy you know i'd, I'd sort of looked around it because it does put a spanner in the works if you're saying that one percent of the of the population are born bad as it were then obviously you would probably have a scale of people that that are born good <laughs> and then you've got everyone else in the middle you've got this in many respects for a subject like sociology it becomes very critical of that because you've got this whole you know area of, of genetic determination but she said that with neuroplasticity this kind of thing early on experiences will cause the brain to develop and change within a certain way anyway so what you can assume to be a, a genetic thing if you like it is in itself shaped i think is, is there a philosophy of psychopaths i think we can find some space for that especially when we look at the sort of cultural variant but to to, to think of of there being people who are wired in a predatory sense who who are i think that fallon calls them interspecies predators that prey on on other people and even if they're not necessarily violent that their whole social world is one of opportunity it's not that they don't understand other people's emotions or or, or empathy they, they just don't actually feel it you you can know that red means stop but you don't feel it the film that jumps to mind is no country for old men 
And when the Woody Harlson character is trying to explain him, and he says Segur is an oddly moral person, he's got a deeply po- ma- powerful moral ethic. And when he, at the end of the film, when he's killing the young woman, and she, you know, the, the wife of the uh, guy that found the money, and she says, "Why are you doing this?" And he goes, "Well, people always say that. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Because I said I would. I made a promise. I promised your husband I'd kill you if he didn't do what I said. Well, he didn't do what I said." I made a promise. In that outline there, John, you can see there's no balance of emotion. It's not working properly. In, in a person without psychopathy, you'd say, you know, I've made a promise, but probably shouldn't kill you. I'm guessing this isn't the future you had pictured for yourself when you first clapped eyes on that money. Don't worry, I'm not the man who's after you. I know that. I've seen him. You've seen him? Man, you're not dead. Huh. What's this guy supposed to be, the ultimate badass? I don't think that's how I'd describe him. How would you describe him? I guess I'd say he doesn't have a sense of humor. His name's Sugar. Sugar? Sugar. Anton Sugar. You know how he found you? Yeah, I know how he found me. It's called a transponder. I know what it's called. He won't find me again. Not that way. Not anyway. Took me about three hours. Yeah, well, I've been immobile. No, you don't understand. What do you do? I'm retired. What did you do? Welder. Settling, MIG, TIG? Any of it. If it can be welded, I can weld it. Cast iron? Yeah. I don't mean braze. I didn't say braze. Pop metal. What did I say? Were you in NAM? Yeah, I was in NAM. Hmm. So was I. So what does that make me, your buddy? Look, you gotta give me this money. I got no other reason to protect you. It's too late. I spent it. Got a million and a half on whores and whiskey and the rest of it just sort of blew it in. How do you know he's not on his way to Odessa? Why would he go to Odessa? Kill your wife. Maybe he's the one who needs to be worried about me. He isn't. (laughs) Yeah. You're not cut out for this. You're just a guy who happened to find those vehicles. I'm across the river at the Hotel Eagle. Carson Wells. Call me when you've had enough. I can even let you keep a little of the money. If I was into cutting deals, why wouldn't I just deal with this guy, Sugar? Oh, no, no, you don't understand. You can't make a deal with him. Even if you gave him the money back, he'd still kill you just for inconveniencing him. He's a peculiar man. I might even say he has principles, principles that transcend money or drugs or anything like that. Not like you. <laughs> yeah, he's not even like me. No, he don't talk as much as you. I give him points for that. For anyone who hasn't seen the film No Country for Old Men, I highly recommend it, by the way. It's one of the Coen Brothers films, 2007. It's based on a book by Cormac McCarthy. And it's exploring, really, through several characters, through several characters' ethics, different approaches to how to live the good life. I mean, you've got the sheriff played by uh, Tommy Lee Jones, uh, Sheriff Bell, whose old-fashioned conservative values and seeking to understand a world of increasing violence that he fails to understand, feels that he's left behind. Maybe that's from the title, No Country for Old Men. As he gets older and approaches retirement, he realises he can't comprehend this world of violence. Then you've got the Woody Hulson character of uh, Carson Wells, who's a kind of pragmatist who understands Segur and the and the character played by Josh Brolin, Llewellyn Moss, whose one act of kindness to bring 
water to a dying man is going to lead to a series of disastrous consequences for him and his family. And then, of course, the psychopath. Unquestionably a psychopath, but not in the terms we've been talking about. I think he's certainly emotionless. He's, he feels nothing, but he's not curious about the world. He has a view. There's this odd rationalism. And I think in that sense, the character of Anton Chigur is rather like the kind of rationalism we've discussed in the past with the Frankfurt School. The idea that enlightenment rationalism, scientific rationalism, forming a structure of rational theory can lead you to disastrous and irrational ends in the sense that the Nazis were deeply rational in their madness. The world we live in is full of rational madness and rules imposed upon a world for purposes that make no sense and yet relentlessly followed through. We see it in the war in Ukraine right now. The Russians and the Ukrainians have absolutely no sane interest, no material interest in fighting each other. Not that Ukrainians are to blame for this war, I'm not suggesting that for a minute. They were the, they are the victims of an invasion. But the Russian attack makes no sense for Russia. Its economy makes no sense for, for its economy, for its people. It makes no, there's no good reason. The Russians should have happily got on with being corrupt alongside the Ukrainians and nicely made themselves richer. The oligarchs could have sailed around in their ridiculous boats and the world would have gone on peacefully, dully, corruptly. But instead, following the mad logic of Putin, some sort of idea of his own destiny or imagined threats, then the war becomes necessary. And a war of insanity is pursued through a relentless kind of logic. Could you argue it's almost Kantian? You know, fidelity to one's duty. There's a paper, Glyn Daly, late 90s, he wrote it, and it was, it's a Lacanian sort of psychoanalytic thing that he does. It's a really, really good. It's called Ideology Paradoxes or, or something like that. And it's, um, it, it, in, in it, the, the sort of second half of it, he then takes the character from, um, the movie Seven, you know the Brad Pitt film, with uh, you know it's quite it's, it's pretty pretty grim film with the, the guy that's got the seven deadly sins and he kills everyone by a different sin, and um, in in the paper he then argues that this figure is is almost the ultimate Kantian figure because he has pure drive fidelity to his duty. I, th I think I think in that paper that that he's kind of comparing that. Lacan wrote a paper called, um, or Marquis de Sade, The Ultimate Kantian, or something like that. So it's, it's kind of playing on that kind of theme again. But so in some respects, the, you could argue perhaps that, uh, that, that the psychopath does become a kind of warped, ultimate Kantian ethical character. Uh, well, and the reason that that is Kantian, the reason the Marquis de Sade or the character of Segur might be Kantian is because, is because of if you believe in moral absolutes, but the moral absolute takes you to the place of answering the front door with the, to the guy with the axe who says, I'm come to kill your friend. And you say he's in the living room. Yeah. Because I can't lie. I mean, much worse if I lie, because I'm making assumptions about your behaviour. And in order to make those assumptions about your behaviour, I'd have to be dishonest. And uh, it's a moral imperative that I'm that, that, that I'm not dishonest. So, so there he is. Yes, I mean him, Himmler as uh, as the the ultimate bad Nazi in a way is oddly is oddly more bad because he's so cold. You know, he, he doesn't take bribes, he doesn't steal, he loves his family, he's a good father. Himmler Himmler called himself a Kantian, though, didn't he? You know, he considered himself Kantian. The idea that look at the hardship that we must go through in order to achieve total commitment and fidelity to his duty. But he has all the characteristics of, of, of psychopathy, doesn't he, really? In the literature, they separate the positive and negative aspects of psychopathy as well, because so, some of the characteristics, like, uh, you know, this very brave, confident, fearless dominance is also quite useful. You know, Andy McNabb, the soldier, the SAS guy, published author, isn't he? But he was, he did the psychopath checklist and he was wired up to one of these brain imaging. I think it's in the John Ronson book, The Psychopath Checklist, that's the one, yeah. Yeah, The Psychopath Test. That's it. He, uh, McNabb, says in it, you know, once he says, look, yeah, you, you score very highly in this, and he and he says, well, that, that explains quite a lot, you know, because obviously being an SAS, an active 
soldier retired he's probably had to be in some pretty you know situations that would require the, the characteristics of a psychopath would be would just be like a positive trait so we admire i think people like the the, the fearless warrior the uh, the person the person who can climb the side of an enormous building without any any safety ropes come on God, that's amazing I mean, i'm really rather impressed by this because we're all subject to all sorts of fears all the time you wait you Although we have a sort of optimism bias, we don't think we're going to get run down every morning. We wouldn't leave the house. But we are, of course, we're fearful of all sorts of things. And, and our society plays on those fears to be genuinely you know, inoculated against fear. Well, it's, it sounds, sounds rather admirable, doesn't it? Did you see the interview on YouTube with the, with the girl who is, um, I, don't, I don't know what she'd be like, sort of late 30s? non-criminal but psychopath you know and it's 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 a series of like sort of four short interviews with her absolutely fascinating and she was saying like growing up they were interviewing saying what's what's your life like you know and she's saying like growing up she knew she was different didn't obviously didn't know it was it's psychopathy but she just didn't feel fear you know like other people did she, she could see no reason why not to do certain things that their friends thought you know uh, probably you know you probably shouldn't do that she just couldn't see w why you wouldn't do it and there's a great bit in there where she's saying about um she says yeah well she says i understand what fear is she says it's something like uh you know I i'm guessing it's just like any other emotion she goes i don't know like like being hungry <laughs> and i'm thinking like that, uh, that's really something that's never been frightened you know it's absolutely nothing like being hungry at all The psychopath isn't uh, a, a kind of monster and in the sense that well, they are a monster, but I mean, they're not a monster in the sense that they're a raving lunatic. So a rabbit, a sort of rabid dog with a foaming mouth and an axe. And, uh, and so ne neither, neither are human beings. I mean, we are, is that, you know, I used to, uh, sometimes I pose a sort of thought experiment to students and it'd be something like this. You know, that if it were the end of the world tomorrow, what would you do? Or if there were no authority, no police, no army, nothing, you know, it, basically it's, per, you know, but even before I got the, I, I, I used to do this before the Purge films appeared, you know, <laughs> and, and, bef, and it's the idea of uh, there's no moral, there's no external restraint on your behaviour. Or you've got a very limited period of time left, in which case the, the absence of moral restraint is because you're all going to be dead in 24 hours. So... So there's, there are no consequences. The consequences are taken away, or the more, or the or the or the external restraint is taken away. What would you do? Well, you know, it's surprising the, the number of boys who said, "Well, I'd go out and attack the nearest young woman." <laughs> and you think, I think, well, yes, yeah, well, uh, and you think, well, because you can never know because it can't construct the experiment. You think, are you saying that because there are girls in the class and you want to sound a bit outrageous, or is that a genuine belief? But in fact. How many how many police are on the streets in most cities most of the time? Very few. We we actually do operate in a fairly I mean consequenceless world in the short term. I mean we we can get away we could get away with far more than we do. Even the surprising thing about human beings is that we we aren't more violent. Having said that, I'm going to I don't, don't know what I'm saying there really because we are terribly terribly violent. <laughs> I said it's good. I think I think everyone's capable of very bad things, John. Really, and I, and I think if you become acclimatised to them, to to violence, you you. I think I've said to you before. I had, I remember being at. I don't know. It was, it was just stuck in my head, but it was. It must have been like six, seven years ago. Being at an MMA fight, and being in. You know, we get like the things behind the. Um, you know, the the cages in the middle. You've got the, the rows of sort of seats the, where the people will hire tables and sit near the cage, and then. The corner staff and everything else come uh, sort of round the back, and I, I, I remember going round to the front bit, and it just stuck in my head because it was a guy, and this is not again, it's, not, it's just this is just an example I think of how you become acclimatised to it. I remember a guy getting finished with, so he's, he's he's sat on top of the other guy, they call it ground and pounding, so he's, he's basically sat on top, of punching and elbowing away, and the guy um, he's knocked out, sort of just right in front of us, and, and I remember looking around, I, I remember walking turning around and if if you're uh, 
at that point I was around you know around a sport most days you know and it's not that you get acclimatized to or you want anyone hurt or anything but if, when you've seen enough people get knocked out it ceases to be a kind of a, a thing really oh, they've just been stopped and I, I remember turning around to the ta- to table to walk away and there were a few couples there and they were like literally holding their heads and looking in real kind of like sh- shock you know like oh you know like really sort of shocked and, and I I remember walking turning my back walking past them and thinking oh you know Maybe I've seen too many of these things now, you know, that becoming acclimatized to something like in a war or uh, in a, say you live in a violent society, you become, you know, if you've grown up in a very violent area, you've been surrounded by violence all of your life, you become acclimatized to it. But I don't think that's the same thing, is it? That, that, doesn't, that doesn't make you a psychopath. I was reading the Stephen Ambrose books about the Americans' progress across France in the Second World War and how the most dangerous time for a soldier when they were surrendering was the first like hour, the first four, 20, no, the, well, immediately when they, when they were surrendering, the first few minutes. If you, if you put your hands up and you surrendered, it was highly likely they'd just shoot you because they're deeply, they're fired up. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're raging with anger and they've been trying to kill you. You've been trying to kill them and you go, no, nope, <laughs> I won't kill you now. And so a lot, an awful lot of people were shot, he says, you know, by Americans, by British, by Germans, just at the moment they surrendered. If you survive the first 20 minutes or so, they start to see you as a human being. It's likely as not an hour later, they're giving you a cup of coffee and asking you, you know, asking you about the war and uh, what got you into this, mate? <laughs> Maybe not, but they're certainly, they start to see you as a human. But I mean, that's what PTSD is, isn't it? You, often people will come back from war and they not be they can't um, conceptualize what they've done you know and bring it into back into being the person that they were you know there's there's a, a blockage the two the two don't meet up I mean I remember seeing a thing on um military uh, psychology uh, military history and saying that before I think it was the second world war uh, soldiers weren't trained literally to kill so very often they did like um analysis of like bullets on a lot of the uh, battlefields and stuff and, and 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 people would fire above they wouldn't actually want to shoot the person in front of them and then then they were psychologically kind of conditioned through training um, to actually then go and kill people and that's when you start to get massive rates of ptsd because you know you can train somebody to act instinctively in that setting but coming back and then if you like when they start to rationalize and reflect upon what they've done it, it becomes difficult for you know these poor people to try and uh, deal with I mean, so it, it, it's just a complicated one with war. What about your area, John, in politics? Well, I think I think if you can either take a liberal stroke, conservative, liberal, you know, American constitutionalist view. So in, 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 the, in the Enlightenment, human beings are bad, probably, and certainly capable of evil. Power, power corrupts. And therefore, people like John Locke and so on, they're going to say, well, here's the answer. Don't give anyone too much power. You know, cre- create a separation of powers. So, so they, they devise a constitution. I mean, the American constitution is premised upon the idea that it's really not a good idea for anyone to monopolize power. Why is that? Because people with, with power are corrupt. You can see plenty of examples of that all around the world. I mean, we, we, it would be a rather good thing, actually, if Putin had, would accept term limits. <laughs> if, only, if only he decided that something about the Soviet... Oh, Soviet. Something about like the Russian constitution meant that you couldn't actually be, a, be the premier for more than five years would be a really rather good thing. And that would be probably true of China as well. I mean, oh, for, but it's highly, you know, it's highly inefficient to keep changing your leaders and changing your government and to cap one power cancelling out the other. But you're going to sacrifice efficiency because your overriding belief is that no one should monopolize power because people are fundamentally going to be corrupted by it. The counter to that is the view that if you can only get society right, if you can only construct a society that is uh, equitable, then then you don't get the corruption of human beings. People are corrupted by unfair societies. So it's, you know, which, which drives human behaviour, society or human behaviour drives society or does society drive human behaviour? Well, that's, the, that's, the, that's kind of the um, political science question. What, what about examples historically, John, of, of, of psychopaths? Could you target any political leaders or, I mean, Nero thinks, springs to mind, doesn't he? But... Yeah, Nero, Nero gets a bit of a bad, well, no, he doesn't get a bit of a bad press. He did kick his wife to death or kick his mother to death. That wasn't good. 
Yeah, so, I mean, Nero, there's, there's the sort of uh, leader who individually murders people, like Nero, or Caligula, who's clearly had some sort of fever in his youth and t- turned from a quite reasonable human being into a complete lunatic. He turns a, turns a senator into... turns a horse into a senator, declares war on the sea, marches a legion into the sea, and they all attack the waves. He did, did a lot of mad stuff. Uh, thought, thought he was a god, therefore he decided, like, like, um, like Mars, he would eat his eat his own offspring, so he pulled the fetus out of his wife and ate it and so on. He did, he's a complete bonkers character. But uh, probably didn't slaughter millions of people. He didn't have the capability to do that. You know, so he was a bad guy to be around because he was off his... because he was either a psychopath or meant deeply disturbed. Maybe if he was a true psychopath, he would be aware of his own survival. That's, that's a question about psychopaths, is how well they survive. They must survive reasonably well if if this genetic tendency is going to be passed on. But, they, but you know, after, after four or five years, though, Caligula gets done in by his bodyguards because he's too mad. And he, after, after about, how long is Nero there? About eight or nine years, he gets done in by, by a coup because he's, you know, in the end, he's too excessive. I mean, if, a, true, a true psychopath would be someone, I think, like, well, you're going to say Hitler or Stalin or Mao or Pol Pot. Because there's, there's elements of narcissism in there as well, isn't there, with psychopathy? They're very, they're very kind of closely interlinked, aren't they? And you, you're an interesting point you've been there, John, about how, you know, the sort of longevity of a psychopath. It seems to be that they just seem to get themselves into one lot of trouble after another, and they're either found out socially for ones that are caught. I remember reading um, John Henry Brown, his name is. He's the um, He was a kind of a lawyer for famous people. He, I think he did Jimi Hendrix and a few others. He was... It's, 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 you know, it's an interesting book because he represented uh, Ted Bundy. It was quite interesting listening to him talk about him because you get this kind of narrative of this master criminal, this really, you know, clever, good-looking kind of sort of master criminal. But he said, no, not at all. He said, if you if you had any kind of, like, sensitivity about people, you could, you, you could spot him a mile off. You know, he said he was, he was just weird. He was a weird guy to be with. He said, like, all the right words in the right order but he said there was something missing and when he came back after having seen him once he was dressed in the same stuff as him and just acting like nothing nothing was unusual and he said it was very a, a very odd kind of character and and that's something else that comes across these people will give you like the sort of heebie-jeebies you know kind of you, you know you can sort of sense that there's there's something not quite right about this person which is which is interesting in itself isn't it well, it is because we, they, it, it, it shouldn't be a very good strategy for be, for operating in society. Then, should it? <laughs> it should be. It should be very. You know, if, you, if you're if you're obviously un, so that people can feel so uncomfortable around you, then how how does Ted Bundy and indeed other murderers can convince people into trusting them and give or signing over their life savings yes my dear i love you you're you're 80 and i'm only 30 but i love you and just sign your will over to me <laughs> this is obviously true <laughs> yeah yeah well but but i think that the, then the, there's the distinction there isn't it between i mean ted bundy obviously had a lot of other things i mean he was he was he would clearly have been a, 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 a you know scored probably at the, the very top of a, a psychopath checklist but but within broader society like you said some of the positive characteristics of psychopathy you can see like so they say that barristers have a high portion surgeons people where you where you're in control of life and death or people's destiny they they have a far higher ratio of uh, of psychopaths within those fields so that's perhaps an area where where having a lot of those characteristics might not appear odd. If you're extremely overconfident, narcissistic, driven, you know, see people as just as as pawns, if you like, to use to manipulate, then it's you can see how it, it might it might be advantageous there, wouldn't it? And and you probably could live quite a uh, what to say normal existence, a, a, a successful existence. Isn't capitalism capitalism itself it's like neoliberal sort of capitalism is itself it's psychopathic, isn't it? In many respects, it just sees only its continuation, doesn't it? In profit, I, I think that's. I think it's true. Are we in a brief discussion before this discussion, we talked about the, the psychopathic world, and uh, if you took the world as a kind of living organism, it's under attack from a very psychopathic race <laughs> or or or, um, or or life form. It may be well that uh, we are on the high road to our own destruction, partly because of this 
psychopathy that is us humans. I mean, I was thinking the other day, we, we talked about why, why does Jeff Bezos build penis-shaped rockets and fire them up to the moon? Oh, not to the moon, to the lower atmosphere, actually, to, and call it space. It's, it's anything other than ego exercise. And I know that, he, you know, no doubt, if Bezos defenders would say he gives tons of money to all sorts of uh, good causes. And but nonetheless, uh, it's a guy who invented a form of selling stuff that made a lot of money rather, rather fortuitously. And so if you said egocentricity, narcissism and sort of pathological behaviour, well, that you're describing the human race. Or at least you're describing the relationship of the human race to the world, to this great organism of the earth, this Gaia that we uh, live, on, live on. If you take it, the sort of James Lovelock's sort of idea of the world, then our relationship to the world is very uh, destructive, very pathological, very uh, egocentric. And in that sense, the earth became the ultimate piece of designed obsolescence since the acquisition of resources produce scarcity, scarcity produces opportunity, opportunity produces profit, and profit releases the greater exploitation and use of resources. It can't go on like this, and yet there's a sort of mad helter-skelter existence that we've been living on these last 150 years or so, which is either going to end because we choose to end it, or it's going to end because we destroy ourselves. There's a theoretical proposition that the reason we haven't been visited by aliens and given the or life forms in other planets or discovered life in other parts of the universe is, uh, this given the length of the time that life has been on Earth, a very short amount of time, and the length of time the universe has existed, a very long amount of time, the, the universe should be teeming with life forms. Well, isn't it just possible that life itself and the consciousness that it produces and the inevitability of the extinction of that consciousness in an individual basis means that all life forms ultimately run themselves into the ground through war or the relentless consumption of their own resources in short-term gain. Maybe capitalism, which destroys us, is the cure for the disease, which is us. like say elements within capitalism in that sense and I mean you say that, that, that's reflective of the sort of human race it, it is but you've also got the other side of psychopaths haven't you you've got like if that's on one scale you have like empaths and people who really uh, uh, feel other people's pain it's very easy to sit here and say like, expect the worst with people but you expect the best as well I mean it's just such a mismatch I mean that, that, that's for me why psychopathy is so interesting because you've just got this sort of this nugget of bad <laughs> well, and again like we said not necessarily always bad you know and then you've got the kind of the sort of cultural popular culture narratives that go along with psychopaths well somewhere i, I listened to an, to a, a policeman describing his interview with fred west and when they when they realized that fred west had been you know with with his wife had been murdering people he was a builder and he's in his house he'd been inviting people in discovering they did they had few connections and killing them and he's also torturing and horrible things and burying them under the floorboards. And then he moved to another house and he did the same thing. Well, they, when, they, when they arrested him, he, when he realises he's been sort of found out, as it were, he takes them to, to his house and says, here's, here in the garden, here's someone, and here's the garden, there's someone over there, and they find these remains in the garden of this previous house. But they say, well, what about your current house? And he didn't want to tell them about that because he, he was rather proud of his DIY. And he, he was upset that the police would destroy it if they were digging people up. <laughs> so, so, so he just thought, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not going to tell you about the, those people because, I, you know, you'll, you'll mess up the, the plastering, which I did. But it's our idea of a nothingness underneath. It's, it, it reminds me a little bit of the, you know, banality of evil, where, you know, the, there's nothing there. E evil, the banality of evil, is, is it, it's a void. It, it's, it's, a, it's a nothingness. So the... The psychopath, I remember um, Tommy Lynn Sells, there was an interview with him on YouTube. He was kind of a you know, heinous character that went hoboing around, I called him a hobo killer, I think, around some states of America. He he gets caught in the end because he goes into this trailer where these two young girls are, slits one's throat, and then slits the other girl's throat. And then she pretends to be dead and he just walks out. And then later on, he's on death row, he's being interviewed. 
you know, he, Stone asks him about the little girl, he, and, he, and he, he looks, he looks at him, and goes, yeah, he goes, he, he goes, I think about if I can just get that little girl still, and I'm thinking, God, oh, dear, you know, it's like a, it literally is, a, is, a, is like it's a, it's a little girl. What, what is wrong with you? You know, and it's kind of like, well, what's wrong with him? Is there's nothing there. Well, if then the psychopath is a nugget of bad, and not us just in a different location at time and place, if it isn't a universal quality, if it's a nugget of bad, then what is this thing? Is it evil? Is that what we're talking about? If you said the finality of evil, then we're asking what the characteristics of evil are. And if evil is an absence or whether evil is a presence. And that, that's, that's much philosophy and theology of the last 2000 years is wondering whether if you sweep goodness out of the human personality, out of the human soul, do you, do you create evil? Is evil the, do we construct on ourselves and on society an edifice of good to suppress the evil that exists at the base of all things, a kind of darkness that is suppressed by the construction of good? Or if you sweep away evil, do you find good the essential beauty of humanity and nature and the world and in fact it is evil that's the edifice and the construct on the surface of good a kind of deviance in that sense is good an absence or is good so is evil an absence or is evil a presence or you might you might say that evil is a necessary you know a necessary evil goodness me it's a necessary evil in the sense that it has to coexist with good in some sort of Manichaean kind of way in which you what you can't have one with the other. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the opposite side of the coin. And uh, this veil of souls which we are passing through, evil is the fire which tempers the metal, which drives out the sin and produces the purity and so on and so on. So, so we're getting a sort of Christian theology of evil and evil becomes necessary. So I mean, from, a, from a Jung, Jung stuff on the shadow, is it that kind of shadow aspect of our personalities? You know, I remember having a conversation with a, a friend of mine who's been to, uh, he was in the Bosnian war and he'd been at war a few times. It's, you know, it's a guy we, you know, I work with sometimes and he's a very, very deep thinking guy. He's fa fascinating. So he was a soldier for many years. And I said, I said to him, no, I, I, I couldn't kill someone. I, I just don't, I just don't think I could. He said, right. He goes, you're in a room now and somebody's pointing a gun at your children. And you've got a gun. What do you do? You'll shoot them," he said. "So now you've done a, you've done in effect, is it a good thing or a bad thing? But you've killed someone. I think everyone thinks that to an extent, don't they? And I think that's that's the appeal of psychopathy within popular culture, isn't it? That's the interest. That is it. It is. It's a, it's a, it's holding a mirror up to ourselves, and it's saying uh, there, but for what could you know? Uh, if it's it's sort of walking on the edge of the cliff and thinking, well, I won't go too close to the edge because I might suddenly get the idea of throwing myself off. What I'm not entirely in charge of the things I do, because we all have that suspicion, the sense the sense of our own, you know, uh, every, you know, the Freudian idea of us not being masters of our own house. I'm I I I have I have changed. What would I do under these circumstances? I don't really know. Um, uh, what what would this what would, what would I do in warfare? I don't really know. And uh, what would I do if I had no consequences for my actions? What, I don't really know. And uh, you know, it's the, uh, uh, the 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 story of Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. You know, mild mannered Doctor Jekyll, who everybody thinks is a great chap, takes the thing and he releases the he, he, the id within him. And you think, well, is is there a, is there a really greedy, horrifying creature within me? Under the, under the right circumstances, would be released. Or if I was placed in a in a, in a terrific moral a, terrific, a situation of survival, what would I do? You know, if, if I was starving, would I would I um, kill people? You know, the uh, the survivors on the on the on the on the Andean mountains. Um, they made they made they made a film about the the, the, rug, the rugby team. Well, well, the, the the interesting thing about that is that some some of them said, look, the only way we're going to survive is to eat frozen dead people. Get a cup strips of their flesh off and eat them, but uh, some didn't, and they starved to death rather than do that. And you might say, well, that's because of their ho they couldn't overcome their uh, culturally ingrained horror of eating human flesh. 
or, or, or were, were they were they able actually to go all the way to starving themselves to death, like like someone who goes on hunger strike, you know? But your psychopath John's the guy that's busily hacking off slices of his dead mate's leg, you know, rubbing his hands together, putting spices in the pot, you know, getting getting all excited because it's nearly ready. <laughs> that that's the guy you probably want to avoid, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, or he's made, he's made friends with a rather chubby bloke, and he says, you're not looking so well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, um, I mean, I remember the stuff we did on, uh, like, Zizek and the real and fantasy. That links into this as well, I think, for the very thing you're saying. And, and I wonder whether or not popular culture, you know, all these crime programmes on TV, it, 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 it is that, the way fantasy mediates what, Zizek would call the real, you know, that inherent failure, trauma, that which cannot be symbolically represented, you know, that kind of blockage point. Sheer fear or trauma is then mediated from us by these characters. So I can kind of understand the serial killer. I can I, I, I can try and understand it, but there's it's it's almost like a halfway point between the other side of that just being this abyss. You know, it's what that Nietzsche says, isn't it? Don't don't look too long into the abyss before it looks back at you or it's something like that. It's at the front of the Robert Resler book because I know that John Douglas, I read his book, was it called Mine Hunter or, or something like that? He, he had a breakdown in the end. He'd spent so much time with these people. I don't know um, how to sort of ex- explain it, but it's there's a primordial aspect of ourselves that finds this kind of thing interesting. I think the attraction of the serial killer in popular culture, and clearly serial killers are there in popular culture, in true crime recreations, in documentaries and podcasts, and maybe what one we're doing today. I think the attraction of the serial killer is that they operate beyond the boundaries that hem in our little lives. They also seem to be that thing we talked about earlier, going up to the edge of the cliff and wondering if you might throw yourself over. Could I be like that? They're, they're also, they're narrativized when we when we hear about the serial killer, we generally hear that about them or they're represented to us as a kind of um, cat and mouse game of, of detective work and so on. So we, whether we would really, I suspect if we did, as you said earlier, if you met any serial killer and fell into conversation with them, they'd, they'd turn out to be odd and dull. There is obviously a, a, a constructive dimension to this insofar as the language that we're using to talk about it has to be situated within some knowledge body for it to have any legitimacy. And, and psychology does have you know, legitimacy there and evolutionary disciplines do as well. So psychopathy is being situated within that. They're looking, and, and that's not to say as well, it, and I'm not going to sit there and say that. It's, it's all a social construction. I don't believe that at all. I think it, it opens up, I mean, it opens up questions of ethics, questions of justice, questions of political science and questions of, of consciousness and our own identity. I mean, the, of what exactly am I? The continuation of personality. We use the psychopaths in order to define ourselves as good. And so you say, well, that, that behavior is... Because, I mean, there's psychopathic behavior collectively, like I'm uh, in warfare. So for instance, in the Second World War, it was quite acceptable to pour bombs onto, onto civilian populations. But that's fairly psychopathic, isn't it, really? You'd have thought, except you say, well, no, it isn't because we're doing that rationally and we're doing it for, the, for a good cause and we're on the side of good. We don't like to do it, but we do it because it's necessary. Well, you know, it doesn't sound a million miles away from where a psychopath might justify there. It's utilitarian, I suppose, wouldn't it? That would be the argument for the greater good. Our fictional world, our world of films, is fascinated by the anti-hero, the character in the film you admire, partly because they are utterly without morality. There's a number of uh, sort of super, superhero, yeah, superhero characters who are basically bad, but ca- somehow do good with their badness. And I think setting a thief to catch a thief, that you need to, the evil and and uh, lack of moral limits is actually quite a good thing if, if it serves some sort of, is, is a means to an end. I think there's an underlying guilt, a suspicion that we have, a kind of... Um, a discomforting suspicion that lies underneath most of our contemporary culture that we've probably got it wrong and that morally we're fairly bankrupt. And it's in that uncomfortable suspicion that the attraction of the psychopath, the morally ambiguous anti-hero or the serial killer appeal. (laughs) 
You've been listening to the Spinoza Triad podcast with myself, John Gibbs, Dr. Richard Miller, and in future episodes, hopefully Dan Rowland. If you've enjoyed our discussion and you like thinking about things like this, you can find all of our episodes on Spotify, Anchor, and many other platforms. Thank you for listening. In 1982, I found myself walking down Kentish Town High Street in North London. I'd not long graduated from university and was doing not much with my time. It was the height of the Thatcherite recession. Jobs were scarce. Unemployment was touching three million. I was not ready yet for a career, but considering all sorts of really quite preposterous things, being a poet, being a writer, maybe teaching, who knows what. I approached Kentish Town Job Centre and went inside. Job centres in those days, boards with small plastic cards in rows, jobs, data processor, experience required. Catering assistant, experience required, and so on. With little experience in anything, there was not much for me. But I noticed a sign which said that I should register and if anything came up and my details suited the position, they might contact me. I waited for my chance to have an interview and soon enough was called forward to a desk. A man somewhat older than me, a shock of dark hair, glasses with dark frames. He steadily filled in the form of my details, my qualifications, the things I was planning to do. I hesitated to outline my ambitions. But when I did, he smiled and said, and I can remember it clearly, that's a hard road. I was pleased because I expected, well, a certain look and a suggestion that I should be more realistic. A few weeks later, I had occasion to return to the job centre to see if they had found anything. I hadn't got a phone I could use, so I had to call in. The same man smiled, called me across, asked me how things were going, and we talked. He checked his index cards. There was nothing. Though I might try the working man's college, they were looking for volunteers, for teaching. I thought I'd give that a go. I left. Some years later, not many years, a face appeared on the evening news I recognised. I'm quite good with faces, but it was the glasses, the shock of brown hair, the squarish jaw. This was Dennis Nielsen, the serial killer, who worked at Kentish Town Job Centre. He seemed nice at the time, but was living a completely double life. His colleagues liked him. He was quiet kept himself to himself. But by the time he interviewed me, he was already well into murdering young men, luring them to his flat and killing them. When the police caught him, apparently, they asked him why he'd done it. And he said, well, I was really hoping you'd tell me that. (laughs) 